And the really neat thing is, a lot of that work was done 18 years ago when I first moved here. That was yesterday. Um, as, as someone spoke of, of the impact and how our presence changed and did some things. So, that's the main theme, is that we're, God is into renewal. He's into bringing new life. And the mind, the heart, the body, we learn, became corrupt. And humanity is falling apart at the seams. And we see that all and more and more. Um, but now, now we see God by His Spirit, through Christ, is, is putting things back together again. Both individually and the whole human race. So there's a sense in which that Paul has been saying, there's a reversal of Adam's sin, people. There's a reversal of the Tower of Babel where, where people said we can reach God and where nations became divided. And there's a reversal of what it means to be the true Israel, to be the true people of God. And so Romans 1 to 4, chapters 1 to 4, really tells the story of creation, the story of Israel, as so as to say that the whole thing was fulfilled in Jesus. And then in chapters 5 to 8, we have the church being given assurance, being affirmed that those who believe this good news, this gospel, are indeed the true humanity. You are the true humanity, the renewed Israel. And then in verse, chapters 9 to 11, Paul is giving the church a, a, an understanding of what we are about as a church. That we have an opportunity to bring that good news to the world, to Israel, by making them jealous that we have hope and life that they always dreamed of being, and to the Gentiles that they might meet Jesus for the first time. But now he turns his attention to us, to the church itself, to our own inner life, what's going on with us as a group. But here's the thing. It's really important for you to hear this. Because this next point, part, point is really enormously important. So often in the church, we seem to think that it's the church's that the church needs to get its act together and become more perfect than it is and then if the church has time we can then engage in mission we can then reach out to the community beyond our church but for Christ and for Paul, reaching out, mission, is the thing that the church is there for. And the whole issue of, of the church and getting the church's life together is to be a reflex to the call of mission, N.T. Wright says. And what that means is uh, the best way I can describe it is when I worked with the Logan people in Dockside in Richmond, B.C. And we would go and we'd live in the community with these people, and, and their lives <laughs> would cause us to come to God in prayer as we lived and walked amongst them, as we saw the drugs and the abuse, as we saw the, the pain and the hurt. And we'd come and we'd cry out to God. And we'd go to our church and we'd say, please, church, how can we become more like the church so that these people can have hope and life and healing? And so by our interaction with, in mission, in reaching out to the, to the people around us, forced us back to God, forced us to His people so that we could find strength and, and God's saving hand and prayer and encouragement and so many things. And one of the great lies, and, and it's, it's not that it's not, there's some indications of it in Scripture, be ye holy as I am holy, or 
set, keep yourself separate. And, and so the church has at some time has said, we're going to keep separate. We're going to be just pure and holy. And we're just going to be good. And in doing so, they've lost the other part of that, which is that God came and dwelt among us. And that the people that were most drawn to Jesus were not the religious people who were the most holy. They were reviled. They did not like Jesus. They were drawn away from Jesus. The people who were drawn to Jesus were the sinners. Because he represented the real heart of God. This man who was pure, who was true holiness. In his holiness, drew sinners to himself. And so we as a church get to do the same. And the important thing is, because so often we as a church think that we exist for ourselves. And we don't. We do not exist for ourselves. That was the mistake Israel made. They got to the place that they forgot. They thought, we are just blessed, period. When in fact, if they read the story that they knew so well again, they would have realized, we are blessed to be a blessing. William Temple put it this way, and I don't know if you've heard this before, but he said, the church is the only society that exists for the benefits of its non-members. The church is there for the world. It is not there for its own sake, precisely because it is the true Israel. And the stumbling block for Israel is they still think that they are there for their own sake. And they fail to understand that in Christ, their mission was fulfilled, and now they get to join Christ and the rest of all those who follow Jesus to continue the mission into the world. And when we discover who we are called to be for the world, we discover who we are to be in ourselves. And so as I, as we minister to the people in our little community in Dockside Village, as we reached out, I then found myself being transformed. I found myself understanding what I needed to become. And this sheltered little boy who was so afraid, if you want to call it hiding and sleeping under a pew, is a metaphor for my life growing up in the church. Because I thought if I just hid here and it was walking in a dark out and said, hey, you know Jesus? And then I'd run back and I'd just be so afraid of that big bad world out there. But when I realized, and, and when I intentionally said, you know what, I'm not called to be a pastor, but I feel like I need to be in the world. I need to pastor the unchurched so that I can then pastor the church. And I was in the world, and I saw the hurt and the pain and the sin at first hand in new ways. It then, A, caused me to come to God and cry out to God, but it also revealed my own sin. My own self-righteousness. My own arrogance. And it caused me to change how I view people. How I view a lot of things. And it continues to change me even up to yesterday. Not this morning, no one. <laughs> okay. So. Um. And, and so when we discover that who we are, we are called to be who we are called to be for the world, we discover who we are to be in ourselves. Let me give you a very concrete example, another one. So take the word, for the world's sake, we as Christians, right, are called to love our enemies. Would we all agree with that? Jesus said that, right? Love your enemies. It's a command. This powerful command has transformed, has transformed lives, has transformed communities, has transformed nations. But here is the amazing thing. The Christian who lives out this command finds themselves transformed. I was talking to someone this week, 
about a, a situation from long ago. And I was able to say, I still have this, I have this huge love for this person. Even though this person doesn't like me at all. I have this huge love for him. And I got to thinking, that is so cool. Yeah. Because God has taken what was because I stepped out in faith and said, I'm going to love this enemy of mine. And I consciously did that time and time again. He then has taken that and transformed my heart with a love that is just there. Period. So, that's the cool part. And I, and I believe that this is so important for us to get. If, if, is that we, as we reach out to the world, we are forced to our knees to call out to God to help us know what to do, how to say, what to speak, and all 